Okay, so we're looking at parts 9 and 10. I've got a ton of questions from the other class, which may have some overlap, but if you want to give me all of your questions, I'll put them on here, and then I can do them chronologically. I keep getting myself off the video. Um, so any questions you guys have, let me add to this. Yeah. 1A. Okay, I got that. You're talking about part nine? Yes. 13? Okay. Uh, and then 15. 15, got that? Uh, number three, part nine. Got that? Number four, part nine. Got that? Part 10. Part 10, number? <laughs> the whole <laughs> The whole part 10? <laughs> um, was it just that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that's the, uh, that's new. So if you know anything about that, that's surprising. So that's the, uh, the function and the absolute value of the function and the function's absolute value of x. Um, it's a lot easier than you might think, so we'll talk about that. Wait, did they already say part nine, 15? Yep. Okay. Anybody else? You can always go back, but it'd be great to get them all in order. That way, if you ever go back and look at this and want a reminder, you won't have to just watch the whole video to find it, because I'll be moving along in order. Is three on part nine on there? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, so we're gonna we're just gonna go through these. Um, I tell you, what, just follow along with me. So part nine, number one a. So here's number one. Um, sadly, I can't see that. Uh, if you can't see this at home, just remember we're on part nine. Sorry about that. We're on number one is a, a, uh, a rational function that's got, it's all factored in the numerator and the denominator, and it asks for what are the horizontal and slant asymptotes. Well, if you remember from pre-cal, on rational functions, uh, they typically will have a horizontal or a slant, but the way you tell is if the power in the numerator is bigger than the denominator, that's when you have a slant. And the only way to find the slant asymptote is to divide the denominator into the numerator and just throw away the remainder, okay? Now, the upside of this question is because they both have an x plus four, x plus four is an indication that this graph has a what? Has a hole. So it would have a hole at negative four, a hole, and you would take that negative four, you first cancel that x plus four out, you would take it, plug it back into the function, right? And that would find the y coordinate of the hole. And then you could come over here and put the hole up wherever that was. But the nice thing about this hole here is when you cancel it, now all you have left on your function is the x plus 2 and the x minus 1 and the x minus 2. Because the whole, the, the whole factors cancel. Now that will make it a lot easier for me to divide. Okay? Now I am going to have to multiply that numerator out which is not a huge deal. X squared, and when you FOIL it, you get a negative X and a positive two X, which is positive X minus two. So at this point, what's the easiest way to divide if your denominator is a single power? Now remember? Your what? Synthetic division. You can do long division, which is fine. It's just kind of a pain. But if I have a single power, and honestly, that's usually the case in AP. There is one kind of problem you need long division for. Um, actually, sometimes even those are synthetically able to be divided synthetically. But um, in this case, I'm gonna take the factor of that, which is a two, remember this? I usually put a little bar around it, kind of separate it from the rest. Take the coefficients, one, one, negative two, and then I'm going to synthetically divide. And if you forget, it's really just a two-step process. You add the column, and one and nothing is one, and then you multiply that by that and put it there. You add the column, and then you multiply that times that and put it there. Now technically, I'm gonna keep going, but remember, a slant asymptote does not care about a remainder. It's, if, I, if I keep the remainder, then all I've done is rewritten this in a different way. If I want the slant asymptote of it, then I just ignore the remainder, and I say y equals what? One x, and since it's a positive three, plus three. So I have a slant asymptote 
of y equals x plus 3. All right, which if I wanted to sketch this graph, I'd come over here and I'd start at plus 3, and I'd, the slope is 1, and I would just plug that thing in there as accurately as I could. And that would be how this graph is a pro The further I go out on it, it's going to have to follow this, depending on whether it's coming from the top or the bottom, and follow that out too. All right? So I don't even have a horizontal. Now, if I do have a horizontal, just to remind you about that, that is when the it's two situations. Either the power on the top and the bottom is the same, or the power's bigger on the bottom. So bigger power on the top, which you can see because it was x cubed and x squared, bigger on the top, slant. Now, if there was an extra factor on the bottom, let's just pretend there was another x plus one there. How about this? Just look at this one. So on number two, I know that number two has a horizontal because the powers are the same on the top and the bottom. But even if this one had an extra x, if you multiplied it out, would you end up with a 1x cubed and then a blah, blah, blah? And on the bottom, you'd end up with a 1x cubed, blah, 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 and you'd have the same power on the top and the bottom? Whenever that happens, if I'm asking you, does it have a horizontal and a slant, you're going to have a horizontal. And the way you find it is you just take the coefficient of that and the coefficient of that, and you say y equals 1 over 1, and you simplify. But if the power is bigger on the bottom, let's just say this had been like an x cubed, then it is always y equals 0. So bigger on the bottom, y equals 0. Same on the top and the bottom, use the coefficients of the highest power, and AP Cal likes to mess with you a little bit. You know, you, got, you guys are used to seeing polynomials written with the highest power to the left. They love to do this joke because they're just evil sometimes. They like to like tack on a 4x cubed right there. And then you look at it and you're like, oh, horizontal asymptote, y equals 1. But the reality of it is because the highest power is bigger, what is it? Slant, and you would have to use long division. You'd have to rewrite this in the right order. But they will do that from time to time because they're just ornery and like to torment you, see what you really know, or see if you're getting just sloppy. But uh, just be on the lookout for that stuff. Especially when we get to limits. A lot of times they're talking about limits, and limits are about behavior. So you need to know what the graph looks like to have an idea. And things like that will throw you off if you're not careful. All right, so that was 1A, horizontal and slant. Um, three and four. So number three says find the equation. Uh, this is a great question to give, especially if, if you're at home and having to take a test, because I don't have to have you graph it. But it's a test to see if you can understand where all these things come from. So I'm going to walk you through this, see if you can follow with me. And to be honest with you, in my opinion, these are easier than me giving you the equation and graphing. Sometimes people don't think that, but once you learn how, you go, oh, that is a little easier. So let me just show you. We can assume because they are rational functions, that it's going to be some y equals or f of x equals, and it's going to have a numerator and a denominator. So here's what I'm going to do. First thing I'm going to do is notice holes. And i got a hole right here. And it looks like the coordinate of that hole was left 1 and then down something. But remember, the, so that, that right there, that hole was negative 1 comma something. But the only indication that there's a hole in this is a common factor, right? Well, what would the common factor have been that gave me a negative 1? X plus 1, put that in there. And that is an indication that there, there was a hole. All right, now, how do you know the second thing I look at are vertical asymptotes? Vertical asymptotes, where do they show up? They show up in the denominator because vertical asymptotes are places where the graph can't hit, which means it's undefined. So I look at, I think, all right, if there's one here, this is one, negative one, two, three, negative four, right there. I know you probably can't see that in video, but negative four, there's a VA. Well, that must have come from a factor of what? X plus four in the denominator. And there's also a VA here at positive three. So at positive 3, there must have also been one. What would that factor have been? X minus 3. Good. So that those gave me whole, the whole, 
and those were my vertical asymptotes. Now, the only other two things I need, the first one is, what did factors in the numerator give me if they weren't holes? X-intercepts. So I look back at here and I go, all right, let me get rid of that so you can see it. It looks like I have crossing pair at negative three. It looks like I am crossing here at zero. And it looks like I'm crossing here at two. So to me, it looks like I have one, two, three x-intercepts. So if those are in the numerator, then what would that give me? An x plus three. An x, I kind of like x's out front, but for now I'll put it right here. And an x minus two. So these are what give me my x-intercepts. So at this point, I've got all my factors on there. I just have one last thing to check. Oh, and by the way, one thing you gotta be careful about is this, and you may not know this regular pre you might. I know, I'm pretty sure you know about bounces. If it bounces, then what does that mean? It's a, in an even power group. Most likely it's a square. I would probably just put a square on it. It is possible it could be a, a fourth power group or a sixth power group, but it's definitely at least a square, right? And also, you may not know this, if the graph at an asymptote ever goes in the same direction, and I don't think that happened on any of these, but like, do you remember the volcano graph? What was the factor on the bottom? X squared. X squared pulls the graph up the asymptote on both sides in the same direction. But if it's an odd power, like one over X, what does it do? Opposite directions. So if I ever saw this graph like going up on the right and also up on the left, that would mean that that VA, I'd have to square it. I don't know that you're gonna see that in this course. I made my kids know that last year, but I just don't think AP gets into that much. All right, now, it will be important when we get to limits, but it won't, we won't be dealing with these ugly rational functions. We'll probably be dealing with a lot more basic, simpler stuff. It won't be this complex. But if I look at this, this VA, was it going in the same direction? No, this one, no, this one, no. Uh, here, no, and here, no. So no squared factors from the VA. But there is a bounce there, isn't there? So that would be a squared x-intercept uh, on that problem. So the only thing I have left is to check the slant. Does it make sense that this would have a slant? And if it does, tell me why. Yeah, it makes sense that there's more factors on the top. There's more factors on the top. So if you had foiled all this out, you would have had an x to the fourth, and then a bunch of junk, right? And if you had multiplied all this out, you would have had an x cubed and a bunch of junk. So it makes sense that there's a slant. Now here's the last thing. If this bottom part is really, if you multiply it out, if it's really an x cubed and the top part is an x to the fourth, what would have happened had I divided an x cubed into an x to the fourth with long division? What would have been the first number you wrote? What times that gives me that? You would have said x, which means your slant asymptote should be y equals one x plus something. But here's the problem. When I look back at this, I, is this rising one and running one? Well, it might or might not be, but I'm not 100% sure. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I know it crosses this slant asymptote. It looks like it crosses at the origin, right? But it also looks like it crosses at the point 30, 10, which means rise 30, run 10. It's kind of hard for me to tell where it's crossing here in the middle. And if you had a problem, it would probably be a little bit easier to see that. I probably wouldn't make it so, the grid so tiny. But if the slope of my line here is rise 30, run 10, then my slope should be three, shouldn't it? And right now it looks like my slope is one. So what do you do to make that work? Make the slope three. So by just throwing a three on there, that means the top part would have been this, right? Which means there would be a three right here. And then when you divide it, you get the slope of three. So you don't have to overly think through it like that. You can just go slope of three, put a three. And then on number four, very similar to this, 
Hopefully we'll be able to go a little more quickly. All right, so this one, y equals, first thing you see or what? Full there at four. So what goes, what goes on top and the bottom? X minus four. And um, next thing, oh, by the way, if you gotta go to the bathroom, go. He did it perfectly, he's just like, that's all I need to see. There's something awkward about an adult asking another adult, can I go potty? So don't ask, <laughs> just go, and you go, okay? Y'all aren't like kindergartners or whatever. It just drives me nuts, like, if I had to ask somebody? I know you guys still do that, and you're probably not even thinking about it because you've done it your whole life. Don't ask, just give me a nod. Good. All right, so there's my hole. What next? I got a VA at negative five. So how about an X plus five? I got a VA at negative two. So how about an X plus two? And I got a VA at three. So how about an X minus three? So, so far I got hole and VA. What next? Don't worry about that yet, but what next? X intercepts. X intercepts, and it's just as easy as this to answer your question. You'll see this. No, I just, I, I like to do it that Oh, you like to do it first. Yeah, if you want to do horizontal first, you can just look at it and go, if the horizontal is a two, um, you can put a two, but here's the one negative of the risk you're taking. If my point was at one half, if it was, what's a factor that would have given me one half? You could say x minus a half, but you could also say 2x minus 1. And if you wrote 2x minus 1, your 2 would already be there. Right? So I like to wait to the end and just correct it at the end, but that's your call. So x-intercepts, what are they? I got a bounce at what? Looks like negative 4. So that means I've got an x plus 4 squared. Great. It crosses at 1. So I've got an x minus one, and then now when I, and this is, these are my x-intercepts. And now when I look at this, I see it would have been x, x squared x, that's an x to the fourth. The bottom, x, 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 that would have been an x to the fourth. But if I divide an x to the fourth into an x to the fourth, if I were to do that, Wouldn't I get y equals one? It would go one time, right? But I don't have a horizontal at y equals one. I have one at y equals two, right? So if I want it to end up being a two, then that would have to be a two, which means that would have to be a two, so just throw a two in there. So really, the way you deal with the horizontal and the way you deal with the slant is really just by making that lead coefficient the right coefficient to make this end up giving you the right value. Y'all with me? Yeah. Okay, that's three, what about eight? And that's four? Okay, um, I talked about this with my group last year. I don't know if you guys talked about this a lot, but on number eight, the question is, how many imaginary roofs does this polynomial have most likely? Okay, so here's how you have to think with polynomials. And honestly, I don't know this is gonna happen a lot for you in Cal. Do you know how if you have a line and it crosses one root? If you have a parabola and it crosses two roots, all right? But if a parabola doesn't cross, we would say it doesn't have any real roots, but it does still have imaginary roots. And an imaginary root is a place where the graph is trying, I think about it like this, it's trying to touch across but it never quite made it. Because if it touched, it would be a double root, and if it crosses, it would be two roots. Well, let's look at powers that are higher than that. Think about a cubic graph. A cubic graph could do this, right? And have three roots. One, two, three, real ones. But it could also do this. Like if I just shift it up, and doesn't it look like that part is trying to get back, but it never made it. So if it looks like you got a bump that's trying to get back, 
that is what you see, because I know it's an x cubed, I know it has to have three roots, but there's just one real one. That means the other two are probably imaginary. So if you ever look at an ugly polynomial and you graph it, and you ever see a place where the, I call it a wiggle, a place that looks like, hey, if it just went down further, it would have touched or maybe crossed. And if it had crossed, it would give me two reals. If it would have touched, it would have given me a double root, which is still two reals, they're just the same. But because it never made it, are you following me? That little wiggle never made it back, or maybe if the wiggle was below, it never quite got there. That's where you see indications of imaginaries. And on, so when I look at this problem, I look at this, well look, when it left, it just went straight up. I didn't see a wiggle there. This one went down and straight back. I didn't see a, a place where it's trying to get back in there. But this one, instead of going up and then back, that's what would have happened if there was no imaginaries. Then because it looks like, hey, wait a minute, it almost looks like I was pushing it, I was pushing it down towards the x-axis, but it just never quite got there. That's an indication of an imaginary pair. That's two imaginaries. And do you remember how imaginaries come in pairs? They're what kind of pairs? Rhymes with monjugate. Conjugate pairs, right? So conjugate pairs would be like 2 plus i, 2 minus i. They're not double roots. They're different, but they have that special property that if you multiply the two factors that have those roots together, all the i's go away. So that would be a pair of imaginaries. But then look, once I hit this, doesn't this go straight up and back? Now look at this. Doesn't this go straight down and back? And doesn't this go straight up? So there are no other imaginaries, but I can eyeball this and see a pair of imaginaries. Now here's the thing. Sometimes the wiggle's so small you can't see it. Well, if you can't see it, you don't really know for certain. But what if this happened? Like what if I know there's a real, real, double, right, because it bounced, real, and then what happens if a graph doesn't bounce, but it looks like it's about to bounce, but then flips in the other direction? That's a triple. Did y'all know that? Because you, you know how the x cube looks, right? The x cube graph does that. It looks like it's about to bounce, but it doesn't, it just reverses course. That's an x cube. That's a triple root. Well, that is too. Now here's the thing, I don't know if it's a triple root or a power five root. I don't know if this is a double root or a power four root, but you'll see I'll say most likely, and most likely it's a double or a triple. Now if I look at this right now, I would go three, four, five, six, seven, eight roots, but two imaginaries. So a total of 10 roots. So how many real roots does it have? Eight. How many imaginaries do you think? Two. What would be the degree of the polynomial then? X to the tenth, most likely. But sometimes you'll have a graph, guys, and the wiggle will be so slight you won't even notice it. What are you going to do? I mean, if I gave you this, if I gave you a graph and it looked like this, okay? Kind of looks like an odd parabola, doesn't it? A, a normal parabola would have that kind of symmetry. So I might look at this and go, okay, looks like there's two roots. But then when I look down at the equation, I see this. What's probably in there? Imaginary. But this little wiggle that happened was so subtle, it changed the direction maybe of the graph, but it was so subtle. Again, you're not gonna have to deal with that kind of stuff. I create these graphs that take me forever to create a graph that doesn't go down to like 500,000, but still has a visible wiggle in it. So I've got like a collection of these that I randomly put on tests and stuff. But again, AP is not big on asking that, but they're big on some other things that are important uh, that have to do with this, so I'm, that's why I put this on here. All right, so that's uh, seven and eight. We also did nine. Okay, numbers 10 through 15. Um, I have to deal with the calculator, so I'm going to hold off on those till the end. I'll probably have time, but um, as of right now, I don't think I'm putting it on there because I'm giving you guys some time to buy your calculator. So if I have time, I'll go over them. It's not a big deal. 
You can always roll in here in the morning if you just need to know. But I think I can get to it. I just want to make sure. So I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to 10 to 15 if you are watching at home. Okay, jump to 21. Okay, so it says, from what you see, this kind of goes back to what we just did. From what you see below, how many imaginary roots does a polynomial have most likely? Okay, so look at this. It just leaves smoothly. Are there any imaginaries there? Now, right here, between that point and that point, if there were no imaginaries, then it should be nice and smooth like this. But look, doesn't it look like I was pushing it back towards it? But it never made it. So that's two imaginaries. This, between here and here, is it nice and smooth? Here and here, nice and smooth? What about here and here, nice and smooth? No, push back. Two imaginaries. What about here to here, nice and smooth? You see a push? No, because it looked like this push made it, right? And then from here to here? So to me, it looks like I had two imaginaries, two imaginaries. Don't tell me this on the test. Don't go one, two imaginaries. Either say two pairs or four imaginaries. All right, now, if I asked you how many real roots, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? So there are seven real, uh, four imaginaries, most likely, unless there's one I just, it's too, it's too small to see. And then the green would be what? 11. If you said actually 11, you'd be okay, but it's an 11th degree uh, polynomial. Yes? Why is the, this imaginary two? Because they always come in pairs. Oh, okay. Imaginary numbers. So if you see a wiggle, there's no way to have one of them. Because remember, if you have one imaginary, then when I multiply it all out, there's going to be I's in your answer. But do you remember what happens if you have like two imaginaries? What happens when you foil it out? I don't think I'll even make them, well, they'd have to be conjugates. Yeah, you end up getting the inside stuff cancels and you end up getting negative four I squared, which is positive four. So I can graph that because it has two imaginaries that are conjugate, conjugates of each other. But if I don't have them in pairs like that, then you end up with an I in your polynomial, and then it's a, it, you can't graph it. At least not on a real number, x, y plane. Y'all follow me? Yeah. All right, from home, um, somebody asked about the properties of polynomial rules. So just to mention the properties of polynomials. Um, so when you're looking at properties of polynomials, you probably remember this from regular and my class. What does it mean if the highest power of your polynomial is even, right? So the highest power is an even number. What does that mean about your left and right behavior? Same direction, okay? And if your highest power is odd, opposite directions, okay? So even, same direction, odd, opposite directions. Now, what does it mean if this number is positive? then the one on the right points up. So positive means up to the right, and then if it's even, has to follow. If it's odd, has to change. If it's negative there, got to go down on the right, and if it's even, has to follow, odd, has to change. Are y'all seeing that? And those are generally the rules for polynomials, and, um, and we've already talked about dimples. So I think, George, you asked about the behavior. I think that's what you were looking for. Um, but uh, make sure you know imaginaries look like little dimples that never made it back. And by the way, uh, remember about doubles and triples and to count those correctly. Um, and then, yeah, remember those rules here. And if you forget them, guys, look at an example. What is x squared look like? What is positive one x squared look like? Up to the right, same direction to the left. Look at something like, what does negative x cubed look like? Negative, down to the right, opposite direction. So just the basic functions that you already know could help you with that learning, but that's true no matter how 
ugly the polynomial ends up being. All right, so that's 21, 22, we said 11th degree. Um, and also, what if you count wrong? Like, what if I accidentally didn't count this as a double? What am I going to end up with here? An even number, but you know it's not an even number. It's going in opposite directions, right? You should know that this is positive lead coefficient, because it's up to the right, and odd power because they're going in different directions. So that can help you catch this error if you forgot to count it as a double or something as a triple. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right, I'm going to jump to part 10, and then I think I'm going to have a great time to go back and look at the calculator. All right, so part 10, you asked about 15. Oh, somebody told me part 10, 15 A and B, but I think you meant part 9, 15 A and B, because there is no 15 A and B. So part 10, and this is actually a big deal in AP Cal. Okay, so if you have no idea what I'm talking about here, don't worry because um, because you've never been taught it. And if you figured it out, like I think I got somebody's homework that's been banished. I think we lost uh, Daniel and uh, to Daddy. Yeah, we lost both of them for two weeks. They don't have it, but they were exposed, so they got sent home. Um, but so they're just kind of working from home now. If that happens to you, no worries. I'm not going to post all this stuff anyway, right? So you just get to chill a little bit, at least in this class. And they're not going to send you to a virtual class unless you get banished permanently. If that, that happens, don't let that happen because then you're not in my class anymore. Um, then you're in access. So, um, but as long as you're gone for two weeks, no big deal. All right, so let's check, take a look at this. This is saying, what's, how do you compare a function with a function of absolute value of x versus an absolute value of f of x. So let's just think about it. What does that mean? It's a function, which is a relationship between x and y, and you just do what? You plug in x values, you get out y values, you mark them on a graph, and you sketch it, and there's your function. Now, what does this say? So before you actually find the y value, you need to make whatever x value is positive. So what that means is, what happens is, even if I say, hey, what happens at, say, negative 3? If I want to know what happens at negative 3, when x is negative 3, when I go to plug it in there, it becomes positive 3. So I end up plugging positive 3, I tell you what, let me use 2. If I want to know what happens at, say, I'll use negative two and a half. If I want to know what happens at negative two and a half, I can't just plug in negative two and a half and mark a point. I can't do that. That's what I do here. Here what I have to do is plug in negative two and a half, but before it gets to the function, I make it positive. So the y value that I end up plotting is not the y value at negative two and a half, is it? It's going to be the y value that I got when I plugged in a positive two and a half. So whatever I got here at positive two and a half, which maybe looks like that, that's what I'm going to end up having at negative two and a half. Let's try negative one. What happens at negative one? Well, if I go to plug in negative one in this function, I get that. But the problem here is, when I go to plug in negative one here, before I can even plug it into the y, I got to make it positive. So the value I get from negative 1 in this, I'm really going to be plotting what? What I got by plugging in a positive 1, which is down here, it looks like negative 2. So at negative 1, I plot negative 2. Well, what am I really doing when you think about it then? I'm reflecting all the positive values of x's, y terms, over the y-axis. So to sketch this, all I really have to do is look at my function, look at the part that I got from having positive x values, completely ignore that. See, you can see I've completely ignored the left part. And I've just taken the right part and reflected it over. And that's all you have to do for these. So you can think about all of what I've just said, or you can go, oh, absolute value on the inside, 
that means that side's going to look just like this reflected over. So what I'd probably do on a test is I would give you this picture. And I'd say, there's your function. And I'd say, I want you on top of this function to sketch f of absolute value of x. So you'd go, oh, well then I don't need this left side. You scribble it out. And you'd go, all right, I'm going to now just use this. So this part stays the same. And then I'm going to maybe mark some points of symmetry. All right, isn't that probably kind of a nice thing to do? Do some symmetry there. This is over here. Maybe over there. Positive two, negative two. And then just sketch it. Are y'all with me? Okay, now, what about absolute value of f of x? This shows up all the time in Cal, even more. What is this saying? At the end of the equation, make everything positive. Because think about it, I'm still gonna plug an x in, then I'm gonna find the y value that goes with it, and then at the very end, what do I do? Make all the y's positive. So bottom line is, any y that would have been negative, at the very end, make it positive. Well, on this function right here, this had all positive y values. No, no, that's not gonna change. This had all positive y values. But this was a down two. Guess what, now it's an up two. This is a down 2.2, now it's an up 2.2. This is a down one, now it's an up one. So you're just gonna flip that over, and then right here, this is a down five. You're gonna go one, two, three, four, five. So this actually flips up. So you can see right here, anything there adds up, anything here adds up. And you will, like I have a vivid memory. This, you're gonna do a lot of this when you're dealing with, do y'all know the difference between velocity and speed? If you take physics, you do. If you don't, you might not. But velocity is directional movement. Like, I mean, directional uh, uh, rate of change. So like if I'm going five miles per hour in my car, you, nobody's going, hey, I'm doing positive five miles per hour. I just doing negative five miles per hour. Nobody talks like that. That's speed when it's always positive, right? I'm cruising around my car. I look at my speedometer. It's not a velocitometer or something. It's just a speedometer, always positive. Velocity has to do with direction, okay? So this might be a velocity curve where you have positive velocities, negative velocities, positive, negative. But if I make everything positive, that's changing it to speed. This would be its speed function. So you will do a lot with velocity and, and speed and acceleration and things like that in this class, which physics people love, because you've already talked about it. And you're like, I remember that, I remember that, I remember that. I had a kid named, I won't say his name, but I had a kid once, he's still around, and I think he has a restaurant now in town. But he, uh, he stunk at calculus, but he loved physics. I mean, he just loved the physics, but he was kind of lazy in here. He was here during the snowmageddon year. So like, I just just him in the back to sleep, or then we missed seven or eight days. And, but that dude passed the AP test with the only made three, and he was smart enough to probably get a four or five, but he was really nice. He passed it, it was all physics, because he knew that physics. So when it got to the physics part of the AP exam, he just killed it. So if you aren't taking physics, it's okay. We'll go back through it, but you'll be seeing it for the first time. If you are taking it, you're gonna be like, and, uh, and what we do is much more basic than a lot of physics, but it does help some people. Um, Y'all liking the new physics guy? Yeah. Oh yeah? He's, he's really great. I taught him a couple of years when he was here. His dad used to be one of my best friends, Homers and I, and Mr. Help, but he, uh, he's a good fella. And he, you can talk to anything about it. I mean, you can talk Dungeons and Dragons, football, philosophy, religion, whatever. He's pretty well-rounded. Interesting dude. Pretty cool guy. Um, I think you'll like it. You got him for what? For one? One? Anybody taking two in here? Taking C. Taking C? Of course you are. Um, okay, so yeah, I think you'll be good. He's got a, quite a load on him. He's got three different AP classes and a computer and a uh, some other thing. You what? Yes. 
He's got a principles in engineering, physics one, physics two, physics C, and it's his first year teaching. He actually taught in India, but he taught English in India. First year teaching physics, but he's, he's a smart guy. I taught him, he was in one of my math team classes. I taught him, kept the 11th grade math team, and then he took, I want to say he took BC maybe from, I, I wasn't teaching guys at the time. What was I? <laughs> Seven, eight? Maybe I was, but maybe he was in Homer's class. Maybe. I don't know. I'd have to look at my pictures. He's up there somewhere. All right. Um, so I think, is everybody good on this? Okay, so let's look at our calculator. So if you're at home and you have a calculator and you have some issues, I'm going to pull up my document camera, which I'm praying will actually load on this crap computer. Um, and it might, and if it doesn't, I'm sorry you guys are going to be, I'm just going to be showing them like this, but hopefully it will load up. Let's see. All right. Pray. Come on. Supposed to be here, supposed to be by Friday. Well, they said it was back over two weeks, so maybe it'll be shipped Friday. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go side by side with these. And then get closer to the camera so it can hear me. Still see? Okay. I'm getting your way, Tom. All right. So I, we got a bunch of glare here, but we'll try to work around. Okay, so I turned on the Inspire. That is unacceptable. Yeah. One second. There's all kinds of rig jobs in here. Make it work. Yeah. All right. Just piecing it together here. Okay, so I turn that one on. I turn this one on. I'm hoping everybody is good with that. Okay? So if you are trying to graph on an Inspire, which I think most of you have, okay, and you have no idea about it, uh, I really do not live over here. If you're trying to live over here, you don't need to. Living over here with documents, new documents, is if you want to save a document and store a document. I don't need to do that, really don't see the necessity of that for what we do in this class. But if you did, like if you wanted to save a whole kind of graph system to help you with, a, with the AP test, store away, okay? And here we go. I'm going to turn this on, and I am going to live over here. Now, calculate is what you want to do like here. You just want to make some calculations. So if I'm on calculate, that's if I want to go 2 times 10 or, or whatever, okay? But if I want to graph, I, just, I can either uh, get back to this and go to graph, or watch, you can toggle with that little uh, calculator button between what I call the scratch pad and the graph pad. So here's your graph. Now, if when you hit graph, the F1 of X types up, you're ready to go. You can just type your equation in. If you don't see that, then the way to get to F1 of X is to hit your tab button. 
So if I just hit the tab button, it pops up. And then I can go in there and type x to the fourth minus three x squared, whoops, sorry. Come down, minus three x squared, and you can hit enter, and it will graph your graph. All right? And then from this, you can start answering questions about it. All right, now jumping to the, uh, to the 84. To the 84, if you had this last year, you already know to hit graph, you hit the graph button. Sorry, you hit the Y equals button. And if you got junk in there, you can delete it. And you just type in your equation there. I'll do the same one. X to the fourth, come down, minus three X squared, and you hit the graph button. Now a lot of times, and you can see it here on the right, Oh, crud, the bell button ring isn't. But you can see it on the right. If you don't like that window right here, go window or go zoom and then go standard or go zoom and square. And it usually gives you a nice window and you'll see it start graphing in a second. Here, if you don't like your window, guys, go almost everything runs through menu, hit menu, click on it. Uh -huh. Click uh, menu, go to four window, and you can either hit standard zoom, which on this calculator is great, because it automatically goes negative 10 to 10, negative 6.4, it gives you a nice, evenly proportioned tick marks both ways. And standard zoom does not mean that here. Here you want to hit standard, then go to square if you want your tick marks to match. But remember, I can always go uh, win menu, window, and I can enter them in manually, with window settings. And then we can talk more about window tomorrow in our meet if we want. I can pull them up and talk about them, but uh, let me know how I can help you guys. We'll see you. Thank you. Yep.